Seasteading. How do we stop the waves? Hello, everybody. I am Nick, the Naval Architect. Continuing our series talking about offshore seasteading. There are lots of dreamers out there who have championed this idea of creating a whole city offshore floating on the sea. And the one thing that rarely happens is they don't ask the engineer. So I'm taking this opportunity to focus on the technology of offshore cities. What do we need to do to create a viable, realistic offshore city? And today we're going to focus specifically on breakwaters. How do you stop the ocean waves to create a safe harbor where we can build a city? Here's the problem with waves. When you think of the ocean, you're probably picturing a nice sunny day with gently rolling waves, probably a few birds chirping in the sky. That's not the ocean. I want you to picture some horrible weather destructive waves that are mountains rolling towards you, ready to cascade down and crush everything in their path. That is the open ocean. That is storm conditions. And when you're an offshore city, you don't have the option to move out of the way. You have to be prepared to weather those heavy storm conditions. The one in a thousand year storm, that's what you really have to be ready for. We are going to be preparing for extreme weather. Now, you might look towards the solutions of the offshore oil and gas industry to see how we could solve this. Their solution is to basically build all of the structures on some form of stilt and have all the structures very high above the waves. That's a very expensive solution, and it's not going to work for any type of seasteading situation, mainly because any city is going to need some sort of reliable infrastructure to dock and interface with freighters. That can only happen in a protected harbor scenario. We need calm water, sheltered from the waves. The city is also going to need to be self-sustaining. That's going to look at food production, which is almost certainly going to depend on aquaculture. Again, we're going to need some sort of protective area for that, either raising vegetative aquaculture or fish aquaculture, or any of the other variations, it's not going to work if a 60-foot tall wave suddenly washes all of that away. So one way or another, we need to create a breakwater, and on a massive scale. Most harbors actually rely on using natural geographic features to create the majority of their protected space, something like an inland lake connected to the big ocean. That's the normal way we would create a harbor on coastal areas. But we don't have that luxury for seasteading. We have to create the entire harbor with our breakwater. So how do you make a breakwater? Well, you're going to obviously need it to be very strong to handle all the pressures of the ocean waves. And the first obvious solution might be just a straight flat wall of concrete going all the way down to the seabed. Except that's our first problem. If we're talking seasteading, where we're at 12 to 200 nautical miles offshore, you can't realistically take that concrete all the way down to the seabed. That's hundreds, if not thousands of meters down. We're not building walls that tall. So instead, we need to create some sort of structure that can block the ocean waves, but more than anything, it has to be a floating breakwater. And if we're talking a floating breakwater, we run into the problem of waves and the water column. When you see the normal wave on the ocean surface, you may not realize this, but the motion of the water that you're seeing, that actually gets copied down and it extends all the way down through the water column. And yes, the motion does taper off as you go down, but it depends on the wavelength. And these are the major problems the long, slow period waves that you see, the big rolling hills on the ocean, something like an 11 second wave period. That's our problem, child. That long period wave has a wavelength from crest to crest of 189 meters. That's huge. 
More importantly, the motion from that wave extends down to at least half of the wavelength. So we're going to have to deal with blocking motion all the way down to a depth of at least 95 meters to block that low period wave. That's a pretty big challenge. So if we're talking of floating breakwater, we've already committed to a very large breakwater. We've either got to make it super deep to block that wave all the way the full depth of the wave, or we've got to make it super wide to try and interfere with that wave over its full wavelength. Now, before I get into any solutions, I need to talk to you about a challenge of my own. The kittens. You see, only 16% of the people that watch this channel are actually subscribed. Friends, my kittens say that is not nearly enough. They are so worried that without the subscribers, their kibble could run out. Or at least that's what they believe. Just look at their faces. How can you deny them their kibble? Please, for their own reassurance, subscribe to the channel. Do it for the kittens. They're cute. They want you to subscribe. Right, solutions. So we come back to that idea of the floating breakwater, which we've already said is going to be very wide or very deep. And it actually turns out when you run through the math, a wide breakwater is probably the better option. But we're not just talking about width in terms of scale. Remember, we're not trying to just block off a small section for a few housing units. Instead, we have to create a breakwater that protects an entire harbor. We're trying to create something the size of a lake out floating out on the ocean. That is a gigantic area. Let's just take a very simple rudimentary example, assuming a large circle that needs to be protected for our breakwater. And let's take it as one nautical mile in diameter on the inside. And we're going to make this a very shallow breakwater, only three meters deep, but 283 meters wide. So we're trying to go for a shallow, wide breakwater. If we built that out of concrete, the concrete alone to create that area, we would need 4.6 million metric tons of concrete. That's at a cost of $615 million. That's just not feasible. That's a ridiculously large amount of money just for the breakwater. And remember, that's just the concrete. We haven't even counted in reinforcing rebar or labor or rental of vessels to deploy all of this. We would actually be looking at a cost of billions of dollars total to build this breakwater. Nuh-uh, that's not happening. We need a better way. We need a new building material, something that prioritizes cost above all else. And as a side benefit, it should also be easily replaced. Even the toughest concrete eventually yields to the power of storms, and we want this breakwater to be there for the next decades, even centuries. So it needs to be something that we can easily replace over time. But we also have to consider the aquaculture. It's not going to do us any good to create some space-age material if it's leaching poison into the local environment and killing all of our fish. And it turns out biological solutions might be a great place to start looking. Think about seaweed. There is something called the Sargasso Sea. It's made from the Sargassum weed, which is a specific type of seaweed. And the Sargasso Sea is actually a floating patch of this seaweed that stretches for hundreds and hundreds of miles across the open ocean. It's able to thrive out in that ocean environment. And this is without any cultivation at all, just growing in the wild. So imagine what would happen if we were to take this Sargassum cultivate it, and use it as a form of breakwater to attenuate those waves. Most of the breakwater material is going to grow on its own. We don't have to supply that at all. Now, I'm a naval architect, not a biologist, so I might be completely off about picking the particular biological material. I do know that there was a study by the University of Maine that specifically looked at kelp forests instead of sargassum. This found some pretty good advantages. For example, kelp grows in rocky terrains. We don't need to cultivate a nice, easy seabed for it. 
and they found when they tried to cultivate this specifically as a means of coastal protection, their kelp was able to attenuate the waves by 30 to 50 percent. Now that's just one study, but it definitely shows that there's some potential in biological solutions as a breakwater. And as a side benefit, kelp is a form of aquaculture. You can harvest that and use it as a food product, or you can even use it as a fertilizer, which is something that you can then trade with the land, adding to that economic sustainability of your seasteading. So let's use kelp for now. Let's take a look at the economics of that. I'm going to take that same large circle, and in this case, I'm going to assume that all I have to do is lay down a wire net as a base for my kelp to anchor to. And I'm doing pretty wide spacing here of every two meters for my net links. Now, this is a very rough cost estimate, but that comes out to only $420,000 for the wire netting alone. Now, just like our concrete estimate, there's clearly a lot more that goes into it. But look at the comparison. At $420,000, that's only 0.07% of the cost of concrete. Or in human terms, that's practically nothing compared to what we were looking at for the cost of concrete. So we've gone from no way not doing it with concrete to this is actually pretty achievable if we're looking for a biological solution with minimal infrastructure. So hooray, problem solved? No, no way on earth. Definitely need more research here. And we need to bring in new expertise. Like I said, I'm a naval architect. I am not a marine ecologist. We have to realize that if we're going to use biological solutions for the breakwater plus aquaculture, we're creating a whole new ecosystem out on the ocean. We're going to have to carefully balance all of those nutrients that are going into that from all the different species that we're bringing on. That's going to require constant monitoring and some sort of capability of correcting this system if it starts to get out of balance. So we're not going to necessarily plan our whole city from the start, but we are going to plan the species that are going into our new environment. We're also going to have to consider all the waste being produced by our new environment, not only from the humans, but also from the aquaculture, the fish, and even the vegetation. We have to consider how all of that's going to balance. I personally don't know. That's where we call in the marine ecologist and build a team of multiple disciplines to solve this problem. So that's looking at breakwaters. We absolutely need one if we're going to build offshore seasteading. And the biggest challenge is the scale. It is going to have to be a massive breakwater. And we are going to be really focusing on cost. How do we make this as cheap as possible? A wide, shallow breakwater is probably the cheaper option. But no matter what, if we only use conventional building materials like concrete, this isn't happening. It's a preconceived conclusion that we need some cheaper building material. And organic solutions definitely have potential. We're either looking at sargassum weed or kelp, or there are plenty of other species out there that I don't know about. That's where we have to realize that we're building a whole new ecosystem. We're going to have to bring in some marine ecologists, create a multidiscipline team to consider both the structural requirements of the breakwater but then also the ecological requirements. It's going to be a view from multiple different systems, and we're looking at not only how to protect ourselves from ocean waves, but how to create a sustainable center for life. Thanks very much. I am Nick, the Naval Architect. Oh, did you want more? Because this is what we give away for free. Imagine what you get if you hire us as a marine consultant. Yes! The primary job of DMS is offering engineering consulting to the maritime industry. If it floats or sinks on purpose, we can help you with it. At DMS, we are here to bring big science and apply them to the smaller vessels, ensuring that everybody gets the maximum potential from their ship.